angels, they who sang together when the foundation of the earth was laid, they who fractured and fell when man came into being, they who guarded the gates of Eden, sought destruction of Sodom, guided God's chosen, and revealed his son. They are a courageous choir, envoys of justice, riders of righteousness, dealers of death. In this video, I am to discuss biblical angels with the goal to entice people to read the works within the Bible so that they may follow more closely the Word of God. If you enjoyed the contents of this video, please remember to like, and if you would want to see more, subscribe. Angels are mentioned 108 times in the Old Testament and 165 times in the New Testament. Each person is said to have an angel assigned to them. The number of angels is speculated to be over 100 million. However, their number is an exact amount, as it is said that a third of heaven fell with Lucifer when he was cast out of the high place. Angels are split between nine ranks. These positions are also referred to as choirs, the reason for the known categories is due to each type being mentioned within the scriptures. Each rank does not necessarily reflect the given power of each choir. However, as we climb the chain of command, the responsibilities of each link bear greater expectations, the closer we get to God. To begin, we start with the furthest tier from heaven, the ninth choir, one that deals with the physical world constantly. These are simply known as angels, they are who are most commonly referred to as guardian angels. Guardian angels are who become assigned to a person from the moment they are conceived till the moment of their death. Every waking moment they follow and seek to protect, fighting spiritual battles around and above you. This rank of angel is also speculated to be the ones who appear as human. They are put on your walk to test your spirit, often appearing as the poor or someone in desperate need. As Hebrews chapter 13 reads, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. It is speculated that it was this rank of angel who accompanied the Lord during the times of Abraham. In Genesis, Abraham has pitched his tent in the plains of Mamre. During the midday, he is sitting in his tent's door when the Most High approaches. Chapter 18 reads, and he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favour in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Abraham and his wife Sarah quickly tend to the three men. After being fed and watered, the Lord and his two companions leave the encampment and head for Sodom. It is here the Lord says, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now, and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. Abraham pleads with the Lord to not destroy the city if there yet be ten righteous persons within it. The Lord agrees, and then his two companions set out for the city. Sodom is the location in which Lot, Abraham's nephew and his family live. It is here, as the two gentlemen walk through the gate, that Lot greets them bowing his face to the ground. Lot pleads with the men to not find a place of rest within the streets, but instead quickly enter his home. The need for this urgency becomes apparent. As before Lot and his household lay down to sleep, the news of new arrivals had reached the other inhabitants of the city. Due to the perversion within the people's hearts, they wished to take these new arrivals and have intercourse with them. The men of Sodom, both old and young of every quarter, demanded to know them. Lot attempts to plead with the people, but only riles them further. Chapter 19 reads, Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. 
And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand, and pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Here we see the power and potential of these angels. With a wave of the hand they were able to blind the assailants in a flash. Within these chapters of Genesis, they fulfill their roles as protectors and guardians. The red verses also showcase how angels can manifest into a physical form and interact with our physical world. They can eat, drink, digest, and if able, even sleep without cause of concern. So, as previously stated, be careful who you entertain, as it might just be a host from heaven. For our next category, we move on to the eighth choir, Archangels. The Greek meaning translates as chief angel. This is due to the power that they hold. There is only one archangel named within the Holy Bible. However, many believe that there is another. To start with the confirmed, we shall discuss Archangel Michael. Michael is who appears within both the Old and New Testament. The book of Daniel, within the Old, is also referred to as the prophecy of Daniel. The first half covers the experiences of Daniel and his friends under kings. Nebuchadnezzar II, Belshazzar, Darius I, and Cyrus II. The second half of the book details the visions and dreams that Daniel received. Daniel chapter 10 is where a man of great glory appears before Daniel whilst he is standing upon the banks of the river Tigris. Before reviewing the scripture, it is important to mention that the being who appears before Daniel and who mentions Michael's name is who I believe to be the pre-incarnate image of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This is due to the importance of them being described as like a man, and that their described physical appearance is found elsewhere in the Bible. It is because of this being that Daniel is revitalized and that his strength returns. Chapter 10 reads, In the third year of Cyrus king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in colour to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remain there with the kings of Persia. From these verses, insight into how strengthening your faith and how it aids the spiritual battles of this world is revealed. Due to Daniel's fasting, a subduing of the body, so that your spirit may grow, the firm grip of the enemy was loosened. The Lord has his people, 
and his kingdoms, and so too does Satan. What we do in the physical affects the spiritual. Our actions open doors to paths unknown to us. It was because of Daniel's heightened spirit that his prayers grew in strength, and the archangel, Michael, was sent to fight the spiritual battle that had hold of Persia. Michael is referred to as one of the chief princes. Because of this, beliefs in more than one archangel are shared. Therefore, the majority of Christians believe another candidate to be Gabriel. Gabriel is first mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel is receiving a vision in which he sees a great battle, a ram and a goat face off, with the ram being knocked to the ground. The goat increases in size and power until its horn, at the peak of its performance, breaks off. In its place, four horns grow up towards the four winds of heaven. It is here that Daniel hears a voice. Chapter 8 reads, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled, the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people? He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice from the Ulai calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. Gabriel is too referred to as having the visage of a man. This has spawned beliefs that the being described in chapter 9, whilst Daniel is on the banks of the river Tigris, is also Gabriel. Angels being in man's image is something we've already discussed in context to Genesis. We as humans are in the Lord's image. We are a reflection of his holiness and divine being. This too applies to angels. The cherubim, who we will discuss later, have the head of a man amongst their animal counterparts. Angels may share his image, but they do not have his likeness. This is what sets us apart as humans. God's greatest creation. Within the Bible, Gabriel is therefore better portrayed as a messenger. Gabriel announced the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah, and two, it was Gabriel who announced the birth of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ to the Virgin Mary. Luke chapter 1 reads, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. For our next category, we move on to the seventh choir, Principalities. The Oxford definition for principality is, quote, a state ruled by a prince. However, that is not the case for angelology within the Christian faith. Principality angels are there to encourage people to pray and practice spiritual disciplines. This is so the individual can grow closer to the Lord. They are also responsible for the education of the arts and sciences, inspiring people in response to their prayers. Principalities also oversee the various nations on earth helping to deliver wisdom to national leaders in times of hardship and decision-making. However, it is also the principalities who are thought to have fallen with the bearer of the original sin. This mentioned theory ties into our next category. The sixth choir, known as powers, are who engage in spiritual warfare against demons. They are also responsible for assisting humans with overcoming temptations to sin, giving them encouragement, and a reminder that good always overcomes evil. However, that does not mean that evil, and the one who is the originator of it, will not stop in their attempt to kill, steal, and destroy. As discussed, the amount of angels is seemingly innumerable, 
but it does have an end. This is because of what is mentioned within the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 reads, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God, and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. A third of heaven fell with their master. Satan, due to his former rank and role within heaven, was held in high regard. The red verses reveal that angels are capable of having positions of command. The archangel Michael was described as fighting Satan with his angels. It is unsure who these angels serving under Michael are, but presumably they are the powers whose responsibility it is to fight against demons. It is my opinion that it is this same choir of angels who sided with Lucifer. Powers are specifically tasked with fighting spiritual warfare. Angels and demons are both spiritual beings. When the fallen angels fell with the serpent, their roles did not change, only their master. As I mentioned, the other choir of angels who I believe sided with Satan are the principalities. As stated within the section covering Daniel, his prayers helped fight the spiritual battle over Persia. The kingdom who the Lord's angels were up against was Lucifer's. Principalities coupled with powers can and will tempt nations to fall to sin. They will also reward said nations with technology and knowledge that is not intended to be known by humans. This belief on powers and principalities is supported by what can be read within Ephesians. Chapter 6 reads, Put on the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. For our next category, we move on to the fifth choir, Virtues. Virtues encourage individuals to strengthen their faith in the Lord. To aid in this endeavour, they are who are responsible for performing miracles on earth. However, they cannot go outside of the natural law. As watchers of the natural world that God has created, their miracles must work within it. The unnatural was reserved for Christ, and upon the completion of the cross, those who follow him. Mark chapter 16 reads, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Therefore virtues will be capable of commanding such things as the weather, a storm, and earthquakes. This commandment over Mother Nature is foreseen in times of significance within the Bible. For instance, within the book of Exodus, when the stone tablets are given to Moses, the sky flashes with lightning, the thunder roars, and the earth quakes around Mount Sinai. For our next category, we move on to the fourth choir, Dominions. Dominions, also referred to as lordships, are who regulate responsibilities of other angels. They act as supervisors over the God-given duties, whilst also acting as a channel for his mercy, spreading his love across the earth. As beings tasked with maintaining the divine order, it is also believed that it was this rank of angel who went into Sodom and Gomorrah in the time of Abraham and Lot. Also during the times of Genesis, because dominions are bearers of God's mercy and love, it is also believed that it was this rank of angel who appeared before Abraham, stopping him from sacrificing his son Isaac. 
Genesis chapter 22 reads, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. For our next category, we move on to the third choir, thrones. Thrones, also known as the Ophanim, are symbols of God's justice and authority. Paul of Tarsus mentions them within Colossians, quote, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. As the symbol of authority, God's throne, they are also who are thought to be the beings mentioned within Revelation. Quote, And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and waste and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Even compared to the other celestial hosts of heaven, the Ophanim are unusual looking. They appear as beryl-coloured wheels within wheels, lit with holy flame, their rims covered with hundreds of eyes. The book of Ezekiel, also called the prophecy of Ezekiel, is one of the major prophetic books of the Old Testament. And it is here we get a precise description. Ezekiel chapter 10 reads, And it came to pass, that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubim, then he went in and stood beside the wheels. And when I looked, behold the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub, and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the colour of a beryl stone. And their whole body, and their backs, and their hands, and their wings, and the wheels, were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel! And when the cherubim went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. From the red verses, it is clear that the Ophanim are coupled together in duty and placement with our next choir, the cherubim. However, before we explore the rank of cherubim, it is important to put forth a largely accepted theory, one of which I subscribe to, and of which has to do with the former identity of Satan. For context, we are to remain within the book of Ezekiel, yet move to a further point in time. Similar to what we have discussed for powers and principalities, Tyrus, like Persia, is under the control of the kingdom of darkness, and it is Ezekiel who the Lord has sent to rebuke this obsidian crown. Chapter 28 reads, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. 
thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. At the time, this was to be addressed to the king of Tyre, but it quickly becomes apparent that Ezekiel is not directly describing the actions of the king, but he is instead ascribing them to long-ago events that have already occurred. The fate of the devil himself is what is being told before the king, as due to his actions and his own self-importance, pride has entered his heart. As they say, pride comes before the fall, and that fall began with Satan. So before Satan's descent, as a cherubim, his duties were to protect God's glory, whilst maintaining a constant record of what happens within the universe. Cherubim are the Lord's throne bearers and attendants. They are who represent God's spirit on earth and who symbolize the worship of God. They are also who sit atop the Ark of the Covenant, holding up the mercy seat, where the Lord would come to speak with his people, the Israelites. Solomon, King David's son, who himself became king over Israel and who was chosen to build the temple of the Lord, had images of cherubim within the said temple. And too, before this time, it was a cherubim who was stationed outside of the Garden of Eden, now that Adam and Eve had fallen from grace. For our next category, and last choir, who are most closest to God, we move on to the seraphim. The seraphim serve as the caretakers of God's throne and continuously shout praises. The name seraphim means the burning ones. It is said that such a bright light emanates from them that nothing, not even other angelic beings, can look upon them. It is also said that there are four of them surrounding God's throne, where they burn eternally from love and zeal for God. A description of them is given within the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. In conclusion, angels are those who bear the weight of righteousness, pulling the chariot of the Lord wherever they go. They are a kaleidoscope of colors, of riches, of wonders. They share God's image, often disguised as man, to not stoke the flames of fear within the hearts of men. They control the wind, the rain, and the storm. They sing praise to his holy name, and on the day of judgment will accompany the king of kings in battle against the fallen who sought to defile the seed, to stop their damnation from being sowed into the tapestry of fate. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, the aim is to get you interested in the works of the Bible. If your interest has been piqued, then please read the original text yourself. If you have additional commentary on angels and the events discussed within this video, then please leave a comment. I look forward to reading them. If you wish to support the work I do here on this channel, please see my Patreon. 
you will be given exclusive access to additional content. On that note, thank you to my patrons and channel members, I am blessed to have your support. If you enjoyed, please remember to like and subscribe, as it helps the channel immensely. God bless, and goodbye.